Hebrews chapter 2 this morning, we're going to be in verses 5 through 18. There's a, there's a statement about Jesus, remember the Hebrews is about Jesus and showing how great he is and how wonderful he is and, and last time we were here a couple weeks ago we talked about that he is greater than the angels. This week it's actually the opposite or the words are opposite because it says now he says he's lower than the angels but we'll look at what that means. But there's a term that's, that's in the Gospels 80 times uh, Jesus refers to himself in this way, and he calls himself the Son of Man. If you look through the Gospels, you read through them, you'll hear that term over and over again. It says it's about 80 times that he refers to himself, or he's called the Son of Man. This morning, we're going to be looking at Jesus' humanity. Why did Jesus have to come and be born and, and live as a man? you have been around the Bible at all in church, you know that Jesus is all 100% God, but he's also 100% man. Do we understand how that could be? No. Only God could do it. But the truth is, he had to be man at the same time as God. And we're going to look this morning, the pastor this morning is going to say, why did he have to be a man? In John 1, it talked about him, and it uses him in the terminology of the word. 1 through 3 says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. And verse 14 says, And the Word, so the Word that was talked about in verses 1 through 3, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. The glory is of the only begotten Father, full of grace and truth. So the word referred to in John is none other than who? Jesus. The word that became flesh and dwelt among us, right? Um, and if you read through the Gospels where it talks about um, when he was born, what was one of his names that referred to him coming in the flesh? I know we're not at Christmas time, but we sing songs about it. What, what's that? Emmanuel, which means... God with us. So this morning as we get into Hebrews, um, the, the focus is Jesus, the man. And we're going to look at why did Jesus become a man? And we're going to look at like, uh, it's eight things I think I've got written down here that are from this text as we look at it this morning. But before we read it, why don't we ask God to guide us on this journey. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your son, Jesus, who, yes, is God, God in the flesh who became man. And Lord, we don't understand how that all came together, but we believe it to be true, that you were God and you were man at the same time. And so, Lord, I pray you'd help us to see, why did you do that? Why did you put aside your glory to become a man? And I uh, pray that it encourages us, it challenges us, it maybe even motivates us to love you more. In Jesus' name, amen. So we'll read through it first, and then we'll go back. For he did not subject the angels of the world to come, to angels, for he did not subject to angels the world to come, concerning which we are speaking, but one has testified somewhere, saying, What is man that you remember him, or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. You have appointed him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him, but now we do not see the, the, all things subjected to him. But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and through whom are all things, and bringing many sons to glory, to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father. For this reason we are not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children whom God has given me. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, 
that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. For assuredly he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things performing to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. A lot there, a lot of scripture. We're going to be looking at eight things that G- why Jesus became man. If you look at the first few verses there, he's actually talking about mankind. When he says for, uh, five through uh, eight, it's really talking about not Jesus himself, but mankind in general. Okay, so and he says that um, uh, in the scripture that's from Isaiah, it says that what is man that you remember him or the son of man, and this isn't referring to Jesus at this moment, that you are concerned about him. You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. You have anointed him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. That goes back to Genesis 1, doesn't it? Look back in Genesis 1. What did Jesus, when he created man... He made a few statements about what man should do, why he created him. Well, 26, he said, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over the earth, all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. When something is repeated, what does that mean? It's important. He's trying to get it. This is the job of mankind. But what happened in the garden? Did man do what he was supposed to do? Did he get crowned with glory the way that he was supposed to? Did did everything come into subjection under him like it was supposed to? No, because his main thing was to rule over it. And what happened? Did he rule over creation? Where do we see that creation ruled over him? Okay, that was after the curse. But when did the creation rule over Adam? The serpent, right? The serpent guided Adam instead of Adam guiding the serpent. Right? So the creation that he was supposed to rule over, ruled over him right off at the beginning. So never has this fulfillment, and you could say that um, the original purpose of man was to rule over creation, and he never did it. And it's never happened fully, even up to this point. You get that? Jesus... Then, that's where we come into who Jesus is. Jesus alone, Christ alone, is the only one able to fulfill the original purpose God stated for man. That's where he's going in this passage. He's like, this is what was supposed to happen. Man was supposed to do this, but he didn't. In fact, if you look through, it's in 1 Corinthians 15, talks about it, where it talks about Adam was the first man, right? And he screwed up. And I can see Adam here. When, we get, when you get to heaven... You know, it's going to be tempting if you, were, if you were tempted in heaven, if you had a sin nature still. You would be tempted to say, Adam, why did you screw up and make me a sinner? Is that going to be a temptation if you could be tempted in heaven? Of course, it's not going to be. Why did you screw up? And you know what he's going to say? Why didn't you live perfectly and get, us, get the creation back to God? Did you catch that? Adam will say to you or me, well, why didn't you just do it right then? And prove that what I did was wrong. And that, you, and, that I could, and that you could do it right and I couldn't. But the point is, we're all, if we were all Adam, like if I was Adam, if Zeke was Adam, and we were there in the beginning, we would have failed too, wouldn't we have? The, oh, there was only one person, only one man, only one human being that could ever fulfill the purpose that God gave to man. And who was that? Jesus, the only one who was perfect, the only one who was able to fulfill it, the, pur- the purpose that was for us. So you might say, well, why did God do it? Well, he did it to show us 
that we needed him. We needed a creator. We needed a savior. So, the, um, so you could say the number one reason that Jesus came, or that we're going to look at, it's not the number one, but one of the reasons that Jesus came was to fulfill the purpose that had been given to mankind right from the beginning. To subdue the earth. To be over it. And it says that, um, uh, like in that verse 8, for in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him, but now we do not yet see things subjected to him. The earth is not in subjection under man, or even under God yet, is it? Whose world is this? It says it's Satan's world, right? This world system is from Satan. It's not from us. It's not Jesus ruling and reigning right now. But will it someday be Jesus ruling and reigning on planet earth? Yes, someday that's going to happen. Read your Bible, it's there. Especially if you look in Revelation. All right, so number one reason is Jesus came to fulfill. He's the, you could say Jesus is the ultimate man. By the way, women, if you're looking for a man like Jesus, <laughs> sorry, you ain't going to find him. But you can find a man that's striving to be like him, though, can't you? And men, you can find a woman who's striving to be like Jesus also. <laughs> but if you think that they're going to be your God, you're going to be very disappointed if they're going to fulfill you like only God can do. So why did Jesus become a man? Look at the next part here. And now we get into who this person is talking about, right? Verse 9. But we do not see him who was made a little lower than the angels, namely Jesus. Well, that's weird. Last time, and if you looked in chapter 1, if you were here a few weeks ago, it talked about Jesus being what? Greater than the angels. Over the angels. Superior to the angels. Now it says he made him a little lower than the angels. But look what it says there. For a little while. You catch that? When was Jesus made a little lower, made lower than the angels for a little while? When he was on earth, right? For a little while. When Jesus was in his, when God was in flesh, in his humanity, on planet earth, it says he was a little lower than the angels. Now he was still God, but he's saying in ranking, in, in authority even at that moment. He made him a little lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Why was Jesus made a little lower than the angels? So that he could taste death for everyone. You may say, isn't that what the scripture said? That's pretty clear, right? Why does it matter that Jesus tasted death? Blood sacrifice. Why does a blood sacrifice matter? Because you and I are sinners. And we needed a Savior. And we needed a Savior who was perfect. So the word there is we needed a substitute. We needed somebody who could take our place. Who could take the place of judgment for us. So that we could be in heaven with God forever. Look at 1 Peter 2, 23. Over to you, right? A few pages. If you're in Hebrews. 1 Peter 2. Start in verse 23. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats. But kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. Did you catch that? There's some good terminology there. It says he himself, Jesus himself, bore our sins on himself on the cross. Why did it matter that he tasted death? Did it matter to him? No, it mattered to us. Because when Jesus Christ tasted death, when he, was, when he died on that cross, he took our sins on himself when he died on that cross. He bore the penalty for that sin, for every sin, that you and I could not 
pay for, or we, if we do pay for, that would be eternally in hell because we could not be good enough to cover our sin. We would have an eternity of paying for it. But Christ, being the perfect sacrifice, which is another aspect here, not only was he our substitute, but it's a substitute of, of a sacrifice. Okay, that's the idea here. Look at Ephesians 5.2, kind of mentions it. Ephesians 5.2 says, And walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. See, Jesus Christ gave himself. It's a substitutionary atonement. He atoned for our sins. He made good on our sins. In other words, he, in fact, it says that in Colossians that all our sins were placed on him, and when he died on that cross, he canceled our debt. The debt that we owed for our sin was canceled when Jesus tasted death on that cross. Now, how does that affect you and I? We've got to just put in a little blurb here. Because yes, he did it for all of us, but it doesn't do you and I any good until we say he did it for me. That's when it becomes a personal relationship. He died for all the sins of the world. He died for everyone who's ever sinned, but... It doesn't do you and I any good until you say, yes, Jesus did it for me. That's the gospel. That's salvation. How do I accept Christ as my Savior? How do I know that I'm destined for heaven? When I say that when he died on that cross, when he tasted death, he did it for me. He took my sin on himself. In fact, Colossians says he nailed him to the cross. He paid the penalty for my sin. He was my substitute. I am the one who should have been on the cross suffering for eternity. But Jesus was my substitute. Jesus sacrificed, took my place, and he paid the debt that I could not pay. He couldn't have done that as just God. Why did Jesus come as a man? So that he could taste death for you and me. Is that pretty cool? He didn't do it. Did that gain him anything? You could say, well, it gained him, uh, you know, us, us in heaven. <laughs> Is that that much of a gain? I mean, really? You know, he gained you guys? I mean, give me a break. Is that that great? <laughs> he gained me? Really? Do I really think that's that great? No, but that shows his love, doesn't it? That he loved us that much that he wanted us to be with him for eternity not because he needed us not because we're you know adding so much to his heaven no but just because he loved us he tasted death he became a man what else do we see here so we talked about he was the ultimate man he fulfilled what man was purpose was on the earth it says here that he tasted death number three going back to that uh, whoops, i got to get back into Hebrews. And it says, For it was fitting for him, in verse, uh, verse 10, For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and through whom are all things, and bringing many sons to glory, to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all one from are all from one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. What does it say? He came as a human, as in as man, God in the flesh. Why? I love that statement there. It's pretty simple. Bring many sons to glory. God's goal in coming as man was to bring people to heaven to be with him. Is that pretty cool? To bring many sons, and, it, and we can use that word very plural here, sons and daughters, you know, okay? Don't, that's what it means. It's not just for men. But to bring many children, you could say. But as many as received them, to them gave you the right to become the children of God, even to them who believe in his name, John 1, 12. God came in the flesh, Jesus, so that he could bring many children into glory with him. That's why he came. 
He had to come as a man in order to accomplish that. To bring many sons to glory. And even in another part, even in the same thing is, and it's similar, but um, expanded maybe, to expand the family, right? He said, because Jesus is saying that God the Father is his father, but he brought many to call him father. And when we accept Christ as our Savior, we now have an eternal father. God the Father is now our father. And I know for some of you, that, that was a pretty neat thing for you. For those of you who, had, who didn't have a dad, or for those of you who had a dad that really wasn't a very good role model as a father, when you come to Christ, then you have a perfect father. By the way, nobody else has a perfect father, right? There's no perfect father on, the, on earth. But there is a perfect father in heaven. And for anyone who calls on him as Savior, he is your father. Abba, Father. Why did he come? To bring many sons to glory and to expand the family. Look at Ephesians 3. Mentions this a little bit. Ephesians 3, 14. And it says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father. This is Paul speaking. From, every, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power, through his spirit and to the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend all the, with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled up in the, uh, to all the fullness of God. God desires to grow his family. Why is God holding off? God is not willing that any should perish, Second Peter says, but that all should come to repentance. God is holding off, waiting for, the, for you and I to accept Him as Savior. Waiting for many, for His family to grow, till that family has come to fruition. All that He has called and all that accept the call. And then Jesus will come back. And we will have Him as Father. And we will live in heaven as a family. And you know what will be cool about that? How many here are part of a family? How many here have a family that's dysfunctional? Guess what? When you get to heaven, you'll be a part of a family that is perfect. And there's no dysfunction. There's no like, um, uh, what's that? Yeah, <laughs> good there will be no fights. There will be no jealousy. There will be no favoritism. It will be a perfect family. And each will love each other perfectly. Is that awesome? One of the reasons that Jesus came in the flesh is so that we could be a family with him and call God the Father our Father. Be excited for that day, huh? When the family is perfect. This side of heaven, guess what? We're going to struggle in our families. But continue to struggle because it's worth, worth struggling with, right? All right, so we said um, that he came to fulfill. Why did he come as man? He came to fulfill what man was supposed to do from the beginning. He came to taste death. He came to bring many sons to glory and expand the family. Let's look at verse 14 back in Hebrews. Why else? Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. Did you realize that Satan has the power of death? Did you realize that Satan is a powerful enemy? Does he, is he all-powerful? No. Who's the only one who's all-powerful? God himself. Jesus is all-powerful. But at the same time that God is all-powerful, does Satan have power? Is his power greater than yours or mine? Sometimes we forget that. He does have a power greater than yours or mine. Can Satan indwell a believer? But can Satan still influence one? And don't think that Satan's so great... Because Satan is not omnipresent either. God is everywhere always at the same time. Satan is not. But 
What helps Satan to be in many places at the same time? His minions, right? Anybody ever watch Minions? It's like that, you know? Satan is, oh, what's his name? Gru? Gru, is it? He's, by the way, Satan is a lot more evil than Gru is. Just saying. Gru kind of wants to be evil, but he doesn't want to be. Yeah, Satan does want to be, and he is. And he has minions, but they're actually called demons. And they're not funny. They are actually very powerful and very evil. And they're always out to do things. To do whatever it takes to get you to be against God. They love to break up families. Break up marriages. Break up churches. Because that's what Satan is in the process of doing. He wants to keep you from being saved, but once you're saved, he wants to make you useless. He wants to make you defeated. He is real. But Jesus came... And let's look at that verse again. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Well, that sounds kind of confusing, doesn't it? How in the world could Jesus dying make Satan, who had the power over death, powerless? That doesn't really make sense when you think of it, does it? That Jesus dying would... Render him powerless. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Back to your left a few pages. Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Towards the end. 53, it says, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's see that again. The power of, okay, the sting of death is what? Sin. How does Jesus' death conquer death? Or the one who has the power over death, which is Satan. Because death is because of sin, right? Uh, Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what we deserve because of sin is death. If there was no sin, there would be no need of... Are you with me? Death only came because of sin, right? It was because of the curse. Adam sinned and Eve. They rebelled against God. They disobeyed Him. And then they were cursed. And what happened? How, how did they try to cover up their nakedness? How, how did Adam and Eve try to cover up their nakedness? Fig leaves. Did it work? Not only fig leaves, what else were they doing? Hiding. Anybody here? Don't have to raise your hand. You ever tried hiding from God? How's that working for you? We do, though, don't we, sometimes? We think we're going to hide from Him. But can we hide from God? No, because he's omnipresent, which means he's everywhere at the same time. So they tried to cover themselves up with organic material. But what did God do? Do you know? What did God do? How did God cover them? With his skin. And when you use his skin, what does that mean? You had an animal. And if you have the animal's skin, what does that mean? You had to kill it. That was the first death. So because of sin, death began. Right? Because the wages, what I deserve, what I earn from my sin is death. Death always means separation. The soul separated from the body. When we go to a funeral and we look in the casket, is the person there? No, it's just a shell. They are gone. Their soul has been separated from their body. But in he, and that's the first step, right? But with humans, with us, you and I, who were created with a soul, it's not only separated from the body, but we can be separated from God for eternity. And my sin separates me from a perfect holy God for eternity. 
That's why Jesus needed to taste death. That's why Jesus needed to come as a man so that he could die. Because uh, look at, if you're still in 15, look at the first couple verses. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. And here it is. For I delivered to you of a first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He raised the third day according to the Scriptures. He was buried. What does it say? He died for my sin. That's the good news of Jesus Christ, isn't it? He died for my sin. So how did He conquer Satan? When He died on the cross. And he took, the, took away the payment of sin. And he took it on himself. Jesus conquered Satan at that time. In fact, you can say, uh, I've heard it said this way, and it's an old Carmen song. Maybe most of you don't even know who Carmen is. It goes way back to when I was young. But and some of you are a lot younger, but even some of you older probably weren't even saved then, so you don't remember him either. But he sang this song, and it just it talked about that what happened. And it kind of builds up this thing. So Jesus, when he dies on the cross, and it's almost like, and it goes with Genesis 3.15, where it says that um, he'll step on the head, or he'll step on the heel. You know, one's a heel wound, one's a head wound. And I know I'm confusing some of you who don't know it. You'll have to read it on your own. But the point in the song is this. So at the moment that Jesus dies on the cross, Satan thinks he's won because Jesus is now dead, right? And a dead God can't do much. Is that true? That's why all religions in the world have dead gods. Who wants to serve a dead God? There ain't much hope for you if you're trying to worship a God that's dead. So it's like when Jesus died on that cross... Satan was victory, and he was starting to rejoice, and his minions, and they were having a party. And it's in this song. And then all of a sudden, there's a countdown. Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. And it's very slow. And then the song is that you can hear like demons or whatever in the background, you know, Saying, what's going on? What's going on? You know, he's counting the wrong way. He's counting the wrong way. And then when it says one, then it says he has won. Because when he rose from the grave, he conquered death. And then Satan was defeated. Is that true? I don't know the name of that song. Do you remember what the name of it was? Champion. Champion. Good job. So if you ever want to listen to that song, it's kind of a funky song, you know. It's, it's different. Carmen was different anyway. He had very different music. Every song is extremely different. But if you ever want to look it up, Carmen and the song Champion, um, it's about that. So, yes, Jesus' death and resurrection actually defeated Jesus. So Jesus had to come in the flesh in order to die and then raise again and defeat Satan who had the power over death. In fact, in the scripture, it's talked about Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren. He's the first one to have died and risen from the grave. But you know what? That gives us hope for those of us who know Christ as Savior. That if he can raise himself from the grave, then who else can he raise? You and me. If we believe in him. All right. Let's keep going. Um, back to Hebrews. 15. And might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. What else? He had to come. Why? Because when he died on the cross, what did it do? It freed us. In fact, there's a, there's a verse in, in the Gospels that said, Whom the Son has set free, he will be free indeed. Romans 8, 1 says, There is now therefore no to those who are in. Hey, you guys are doing good this morning. He set free the, those who were slaves of death. By the way, every one of us before Christ is a slave of death. We have no other alternative. We will be separated from God for eternity because of our sin. And Jesus, when he came in the flesh, 
He came to free us from being a slave of death. And now we can have life and life eternal. Pretty cool, huh? Why did he come? To set us free. Verse 16, going on. For surely he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. Therefore he had to make... He had to be made like his brethren in all things. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things. So it says lower than the angels, but how are we, you and I, better than the angels? Jesus came for us. The angels had one decision. They either stayed with God or they rebelled and became demons. But you and I can fail and fail and fail and yet God will still forgive and reconcile. That's pretty cool. That makes us greater than the angels. Let's read that again. For assuredly, he does not give help to the angels. In other words, they are who they are. But he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. Now, specifically, these would be the Israelites. But he's talking about humanity in general. You and I, he came for, he died for, he became in the flesh for to give us help. The help that only he could give us. The help that we needed. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren. Why did he have to be made like his brethren? Why did he have to come in the flesh? In order to help you and I. In order to help us. In order to bring us to Christ. And bring us to heaven. He had to be made in human form in order to do that. Why? Because that was God's plan. That's the way he did it. Thank you, Lord, for being faithful. Next, going on in that same verse, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God. A, a merciful and faithful high priest. In the Old Testament, what did priests do? They sacrificed. Right? For people. So in other words, took the sin, sacrificed. They did the sacrifices because if you sinned, then in order to get right with God, you'd come to the priest. The priest would take your sin. It would kind of be placed on the bowl or whatever it was at that time. And by the way, you'd have your hand on that animal and the priest would slit its throat. Talk about understanding that that animal was taking your place, huh? That's a graphic image, wouldn't it be? Picture that. The priest is there. They're holding this lamb. Your hand is on the lamb. You're, you brought the lamb to them. It had to be a lamb without spot or, a spot or blemish. And they would, the best, and they would slit the throat. And the idea was that this lamb was taking the place of your sin. If we use that imagery, do you think that would stick with us more? That somebody had to take my place because of my sin? Kind of goes back to the first one we talked about, one of the first ones, that he is our substitute, right? That lamb was the substitute. It didn't take away sin, but it covered it. And that's why they had to continue. If they sinned again, they had to do it again. They had to do it again. So they're offering animals all the time to take the place of their sin. And we'll talk about that immensely when we get further in Hebrews, but that Jesus came and uh, gave of himself the perfect spotless lamb of God and gave that one sacrifice for sins. And we don't have to keep doing it over and over again because he cleansed us from sin. He didn't just cover it. So he's the merciful and faithful high priest. He's also, what it talks about is uh, a priest would also, he's the one who stands between us and God, right? A priest stands between us and God, helps us be reconciled to God, helps us get right with God. Jesus, the merciful and the great high priest, now we don't have to go to a man priest on earth in order to go to God. Jesus himself, God in the flesh, he is our faithful high priest, so now we can come boldly before the throne of grace and find mercy and help in time of need. We can pray directly to God because of our great high priest, Jesus Christ. Is that awesome? We don't have to go through. Now, does it say to sometimes that we should confess our sins to one another so we can be praying for each other? Yes, but we don't have to. It isn't necessary because we can go directly to God ourselves through Jesus. But he had to come to earth in order for that to happen, in order for us to understand it. 
But he goes on, and, and what does he say here? It, it, this ties together, but adds to it. He says, and become a, might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Jesus came to be a satisfaction for my sin. Propitiation is a big word. Simplest way I can say it, it means satisfaction. And Jesus is the satisfaction for my sin to the Father. I deserved, because of my sin, to be judged, to be condemned to hell for eternity. But Jesus came, and He made satisfaction for that judgment to God the Father, so that now I can be um, in heaven for eternity instead of hell. I can be set free instead of under condemnation. Thank you, Jesus. It has the idea of the sprinkling of the blood that would happen in the Old Testament on the mercy seat. And that would, and, and that would cover the, the idea of the mercy seat was where God dwelt. And, um, and that actually they would do, um, the children of Israel would do that once a year for the sin of the whole people just in case somebody hadn't asked forgiveness for it. And they would actually have what was called a scapegoat. They would actually, one time a year, they would put... For any unconfessed sin throughout the whole year, they would place it on this. They would, uh, they'd have two red heifers. One they would sacrifice, and one they would be like putting it on it, and they would send it out. And they would make sure it went a long ways and never came back. But it would go out, and it was kind of resembling that uh, the sins that they didn't even know about, didn't even think about, would be taken away from the camp, from the congregation, so that they could be clean before God. And then lastly is verse 18. For since he himself was tempted, in that he has suffered, he is able to aid or able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. He is able to come to, he understands what we're going through. Now, did Jesus understand what you're going through before he came to earth? Yes or no? Yes, he did. But this shows how much he loved us. Because is it hard for us to understand that he even know, understands what we're going through even now? Is it hard for us to sometimes get it that Jesus actually understands what we go through on planet Earth? I think it is. Well, it says here in this verse, one of the reasons that Jesus came in the flesh was so that we would know that he understands what we go through. He understands our temptation. Now, John, now and it's talking about tempting in this verse specifically, isn't it? James 1.13 says that God is never tempted, nor does he tempt anyone. So is he tempted to sin? No. But was Jesus tested? Was he tested to be tempted? We could say it that way. Yes or no? And we don't have time or, or for lack of time, but Matthew chapter 4 talks about it, doesn't it? There's a temptation that comes from within. That's our sin nature, right? Jesus didn't have that. There was no temptation from within because he's God. He's 100% pure. There was no temptation from within. You and I have temptation from within, don't we? we, we a lot of times in our mind, we're tempted to do things that we know we shouldn't be doing and say things that we know we shouldn't be saying, and we do it anyway. So we have that temptation from within. Jesus never had that. But we also, there's a temptation from without, right? We talked about the devil earlier. And there's a temptation from without sometimes. They come to us from outside. Jesus had that temptation. He never had the temptation on the inside because he doesn't have a sin nature. And, he, and he's God and 100% pure. But did Satan try to tempt him? Yes. And Satan tempted him. We won't go there, like I said, for sake of time. But, but one of the things, so he's tempted Jesus the same way he tempts us. If you look at Matthew chapter 4 and look at his temptation... If you look at 1 John 2, 15 through 17, it says the three ways that God tempts us. If you look in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3, the three ways that, God, that uh, the serpent tempted Adam and Eve, it's all the same. And guess what? It's the same the way, God, the way Satan tempts us today. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's the way we all get tempted now. It's the way it has been throughout all humanity. Now, the thing about Satan's temptations... We call them this. This would be a whole study on Matthew 4 or, or a whole message in itself. Satan has designer temptations for you and me. 
I'll give you an example. When he tempted Jesus, he said, turn this stone to be bread. Jesus had been fasting for 40 days. Was he hungry? Could Jesus turn a stone into... Now, if, if Satan said to you, cast this stone, turn this stone into bread, and you were hungry, would it be a temptation for you? No, it wouldn't, because no way could you turn it into bread, right? It wouldn't really be able to fit you because you couldn't do it. That's a designer temptation, something that you can do that you shouldn't be doing that fits you perfectly. Satan knows you and me, and he has designer temptations just for you and I. That's why we need our faithful high priest close to us, close in fellowship, help us to know when we're being tempted by the, the evil one. Jesus, humanity matters. He came in the flesh, not because it was great for him, but because it was great for us. He was made a little lower than the angels, a little while, but guess what? He's not lower now, is he? Philippians chapter 2, it's called the kenosis, the emptying. It says when he emptied himself of his glory for a little while so that he could go, be, come to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus did that for you. What should we get this message this morning? How great Jesus is and how much he loves you. And that should make you or cause you or your response should be to love him more. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. I thank you for Jesus, your son. I thank you for coming down to earth, being born as a baby, coming in humanity, God in the flesh. Why? Not for yourself, but because you loved us. Oh, we are so unworthy, Lord, but let, may we be thankful. And may what we know about your humanity challenge us to love you more. Challenge us, encourage us to serve you more. Excite us to want to tell others about you more. Not because we have to, but because we realize what you did for us. And we're thankful. In Jesus' name, amen.